Okay, good evening and welcome everyone to the Department of Physics of the University of Oxford and our event tonight, Nuclear Risk and how we can work to reduce it. My name is Moritz Riede and I'm an academic here in the department. It's my great pleasure to have two distinguished speakers here tonight, Dr. David Elwood and Dr. Peter Collick. Peter actually studied physics and did his PhD in quantum field theory, something I don't know much about or have forgotten since I did my undergrad time. Um, and then worked one year as postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Physics and Astrophysics in Munich before transitioning to the British Diplomatic Service. And after a very successful career, he retired after being UK ambassador to Brazil. David is former research director of the Clay Mathematics Institute in the UK and has held various positions around the world, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Paris, um, uh, Pierre Marie Curie University in France, the ETH in Zurich, Boston University in Harvard. He also serves on the executive committee of British Pugwash, which is the UK chapter of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, uh, which were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995, together with Sir Joseph Rotblat, about whom we're probably going to hear a fair bit in this talk. And with that, I would like to hand over the stage to David and Peter. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Moritz, and thank you to the Department of Physics for um, inviting us here to speak to you today. It's a really great pleasure and honor, and um, it's a topic that we feel very passionately about, and it's just great to have an opportunity to talk to you about it today, and hopefully kindle some more interest in the subject, because I think that it's a little bit under the radar at the moment. So um, I should, one minor correction, um, I was former research director of the Clay Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so 10 years ago, it moved to Oxford, and it moved away from me. So, um, so anyway, I, no confusion there. Anyway, um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to Ziam Yan and Stuart Prager at the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which really gave us the impetus, um, provided us with the impetus to, to, to have these talks. And um, they've been a great source of support and information and slides as well, so um, we're really grateful to them. So, um, let's see if I can get this working. Okay, good. Um, well, the news, although it shouldn't really be news, is that the nuclear arms threat is really as extreme as ever. Um, does everybody here know about the doomsday clock? Does anybody not know about the doomsday clock? Well, um, the Doomsday Clock was uh, something that was initiated back in 1947 by a panel of experts convened by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And it was originally set at the dawn of the Cold War at seven minutes to midnight. Well, it's moved back and forth a lot over the years, but it's currently at 90 seconds to midnight. It was set there on January of this year. So that's closer to midnight than it's ever been, closer to midnight than it was during the, any point in the Cold War or the Cuban Missile Crisis or anything like that. So there are um, experts who study these issues, and they're extremely concerned about the state of affairs at the moment. Um, now, why is that the case? Well, there are many reasons, but uh, several leading industrial nations continue to support a security architecture that includes a so-called nuclear deterrent. Now, I'm not here to debate its deterrent value today, but it's incredible to think about the world order that we've created. A few men can end civilizations within minutes of deciding to do so. So, in particular, Vladimir Putin, Joe Biden, really have the power to do this. I mean, we've created a, a security architecture that permits this possibility, which is very, very strange to have evolved um, in the 20th and early 21st century. Now, also, Macron, Xi, Sunak, Sharif, Modi, Netanyahu, and others can kill hundreds of millions with the push of a button. So it's a very strange world that we live in, and it's one that's not really um, in the public. Um, uh, the public are really not really aware of this anymore. Um, politicians seem to be under their radar. There's no big political um, concern about this. And uh, intellectuals no longer seem to be pressing um, us to think about these issues and if we can do something to reduce the risk. 
So, it's really up to physicists. The threat is unstable and getting worse, but it can be reduced. It's something that we have created, and uh, it's off the radar of the public. And, uh, but as physicists, you really do have a special, um, a special knowledge, a special background, and a, a special vantage point in which to address this and, and help increase awareness. Now, I don't know whether you would be patient enough to give me a couple of extra minutes, but if you are, um, I can show you just quite how, how I got concerned to get involved in this a year ago, to give talks like this. Um, and I've got a little public service announcement by the New York City um, um, Disaster Awareness Unit. Um, can I play that to you? Okay. So, here we go. See if this works. So there's been a nuclear attack. Don't ask me how or why, just know that the big one has hit. Okay? So what do we do? There are three important steps that I want you to remember. Step one, get inside fast. You, your friends, your family, get inside. And no, staying in the car is not an option. You need to get into a building and move away from the windows. Step two, stay inside. Shut all doors and windows. Have a basement? Head there. If you don't have one, get as far into the middle of the building as possible. If you were outside after the blast, get clean immediately. Remove and bag all outer clothing to keep radioactive dust or ash away from your body. Step three, stay tuned. Follow media for more information. Don't forget to sign up for Notify NYC for official alerts and updates. And don't go outside until officials say it's safe. All right, you've got this. Okay, so um, when I saw that, that concerned me a lot, and um, I thought, we've got to do something about this. So what can we do? Um, well, today we'll review a little bit about Pugwash, its history, nuclear weapons, what they are and what they do, the growing danger some effective policies and what the physics community can do. So I'll address the first two sections and I'll hand over to my colleague Peter, who will take it from there. Um, to many people, they're a bit confused when we talk about Pugwash, so I thought I'd start by just saying a little bit about the origins of Pugwash. I'm a, I'm a member of the executive committee, and it's a, it's a really wonderful organization that I really treasure that I've had the opportunity to contribute in some small way. Um, it dates back 68 years to a document called the Russell-Einstein Manifesto. This was an anti-war project initiated by Bertrand Russell in the final weeks of Einstein's life. The manifesto itself is now well known, so I'd like to begin by offering you an insight to how it came about. It began with a letter from Russell to Einstein on February 11, 1955, in which he wrote, Oops, sorry. not used to the technology. There we go. In common with every other thinking person, I'm profoundly disquieted by the armaments race in nuclear weapons. You have on various occasions given expression to feelings and opinions with which I am in close agreement. I think that eminent scientists ought to do something dramatic to bring home to the public and governments the disasters that may occur. Do you think it would be possible to get, say, six scientists of the very highest repute, headed by yourself, to make a very solemn statement about the imperative necessity of avoiding war, those chosen should be so diverse in their politics that any statement signed by all of them would obviously be free from pro-communist or anti-communist bias. So in his letter, Russell went on to describe what he saw as the essential points. In particular, he stressed, the thing to emphasize is that a future war may well mean the extinction of life on this planet. The Russian and American governments do not think so. They should have no excuses for continued ignorance on this point. 
And although the H-bomb at the moment occupies the center of attention, it does not exhaust the destructive possibilities of science. This reinforces the general proposition that war and science can no longer exist. So from there, Russell and Einstein began corresponding very frequently, almost at a weekly interval, until um, Russell prepared a draft of his statement, which became, later became the manifesto. And, um, and uh, he uh, sent it to Einstein, and at the, on April the 5th, 1955, um, Einstein gladly agreed to sign and wrote, thank you for your letter of April the 5th. I'm gladly willing to sign your statement. I also agree with your choice of the prospective signers. Einstein's signature on the Russell statement was to be his last. He became fatally ill two days later and passed away on April the 18th in Princeton, New Jersey. Now that statement is now known as the Russell Einstein Manifesto. It was released at a press conference in Caxton Hall, London on July the 9th, 1955. One of the signatories, Joseph Rotblatt, organized and chaired the meeting while Russell read out the manifesto. In particular, the manifesto called for convening a group of committed scientists to pursue its aims through an international conference on science and world affairs, the first of which was held in July 1957 in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, the birthplace of Cyrus Eaton, a Canadian industrialist who <coughs> supplied the venue as well as the necessary funds. I have to go over here. Oops. Okay. So the ensuing movement grew quickly in influence and prestige, taking on the name of its inaugural meeting place and developed into an international organization that brought scholars and public figures together to work towards reducing the danger of armed conflict and to seek solutions to global security threats, particularly those related to nuclear warfare. Rotblatt organized the first of these with Russell and remained its champion to the end of his life. Rotblatt was the youngest signatory on the Russell-Einstein Manifesto and became one of the most prominent, prominent critics of the nuclear arms race. He believed in particular that scientists should always be concerned with the ethical consequences of their work. I can't help but give you one um, small paragraph that was written by this man. Um, it's, his scientific achievements were so great, we tend not to think about um, how much work he did for humanitarian causes and, and his fight against militarism. So I picked out a paragraph that he wrote in October 1930 in an essay called The World as I See It. He said, this brings me to the worst outgrowth of the herd life, the military system which I abhor. This shameful stain on civilization should be wiped out as soon as possible. Heroism on command, senseless violence, and all the loathsome nonsense that goes by the name of patriotism how passionately I despise them, how vile and contemptible war seems to me. I would rather be torn limb from limb than take part in such an ugly business. I happen to think highly enough of mankind to believe that the specter of war would long have since disappeared, had the sound common sense of the people not been systematically corrupted by commercial and political interests operating through the schools and the press. Well, um, in 1930, um, the idea of a nuclear weapon was still fiction, science fiction. You see, the physics of these things is that um, energy is released from naturally occurring radioactive isotopes very slowly, uh, obviously over billions of years if they still exist in any quantity on the Earth. Um, but um, this unconventional genius that you might recognize is Leo Zillard, and uh, in 1933, he was living in opulent luxury in the Imperial Hotel in Russell Square, London, not far from the Pugwash offices. Supported by income he derived on selling inventions to several big European companies. In 1932, Chadwick had discovered the neutron, and while waiting to cross the road outside his hotel, Zillard had a terrifying thought. If splitting nuclei admits neutrons, and neutrons can induce more splitting, then neutrons from the fission of one nucleus could cause the fission of others. If this could all cascade in a self-sustained reaction, reaction, the amplification mechanism for nuclear energy would be achieved. So, um, I don't think there's any members of the general public here today, but I'll say a couple of words anyway. Um, people have a hard idea in getting used to really big numbers. And uh, in school, 
we're all taught about the chessboard, chessboard problem where the Grand Vizier to King Shirham in northern India was given a gift. The Grand Vizier gave King Shirham a gift to teach him military strategy, which turned, evolved into the present day of chess. And on this 8 by 8 chessboard, in uh, gratitude for the gift, um, the king granted the Grand Vizier anything he desired. And he said, well, I want one grain of rice for the first square, two grains for the second, four for the third, and so forth, doubling each time until we fill up all 64 squares. Well, does anybody have a feeling for how tall the column of rice would be on the last square? I, 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 did, I did my homework. I did a 20 by 20 uh, rice in a two-inch square, which is typical for a chessboard. So does it go all the way to New York, or to the moon, or to the sun? Does anybody, anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes? So around the moon, around the moon. So good guess, but I'm afraid we have to go a great deal further. Um, the, the rice on the last square is the order of 10 to the 19 grains, right? That will take us outside of the solar system into interstellar space. So we're talking about going through the heliopause into the Oort cloud. So that's a mighty tall column of rice on the last square. And obviously, poor King Shirham could not grant uh, the request of his Grand Vizier. Well, that seems like a big number, 10 to the 19. Oops, am I on the wrong one? Sorry. I've done something wrong. Excuse me for a second. Um, but if you, um, if you uh, think about a kilo of uranium-235, which is really the simplest thing to fish, so I'll say fish. Um, that was the code name for fission um, during the Manhattan Project. Um, you've got about 10 to the 24 atoms of U-235 in that. So that, that's an awful lot, an awful big number. So the chessboard won't quite do that. So you have to have a 9 by 9 chessboard. You need 80 generations of doubling to get to a figure like 10 to the 24. Now, if, if fishing each UT, U-235 releases 200 megavolt, mega electron volts of energy, that's going to produce a heck of a lot of energy. Now, once again, it's hard to get a feeling for that. Um, and uh, when you look at the chain reaction, um, it, you know, uh, one way it's explained is it's 20 kilotons of TNT, which is the size of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. So in one kilogram of U-235, latent in that, if you, could, if you could fish that whole kilogram, you'd end up with a tremendous amount of energy. Um, to put that in another, another way of putting that is think of the largest power station in the UK. It's the Drax power station massive power station in North Yorkshire. And um, the, um, I think it's something like 33 gigawatt hours um, in a year it produces. And what we're talking here is about 23 gigawatt hours, but in a microsecond. So I want to bring home that a nuclear bomb, even a modest one, 20 kilotons, is releasing an amount of energy which it's not really a bomb. Uh, I mean, People think, that, oh, they've got big bombs, I should have big bombs. That makes us safer. You know, what we're talking about here is a totally different order of magnitude of weapon, and basically a weapon of, of genocide. So um, I don't know if I've got time to say anything about critical mass, but, um, but basically one of the problems in building these things, one of the um, critical problems in the beginning, was um, the neutrons might just leak out. Um, so, you know, you want them to fuse uh, other uranium-235 atoms, and you find that the mean free path in U-235 is about 13.5 centimeters. So, when scientists were looking at this during World War II, in particular Heisenberg, he may have given up when he calculated the critical mass was going to be about 200 kilograms of U-235. So, he might have thought, well, you know, there's no way we're going to get that amount of U-235, so we might as well abandon the project. We don't really know, but, um, but that might have been one of the reasons that he considered. However, Oppenheimer in Los Alamos had the idea of reflecting the neutrons, having a neutron reflecting material around the bomb, and by that way he could reduce the critical mass to 15 kilograms. So um, then it became feasible, but nevertheless, um, the Los Alamos scientists couldn't test um, Little Boy, which was the uh, bomb 
that was ultimately dropped on Hiroshima because they didn't have enough uranium for a second bomb at that time. So it, it's, a, it's rather hard to produce this stuff, but that's the subject of another talk. So basically, this is how um, the simplest type of fission weapon works. Uh, it was uh, the, t the type that was dropped on Hiroshima. You, you can't, you know, the spontaneous fission, so you have to keep, you can't assemble the critical mass until you're ready to, um, to ignite the, the weapon. Um, so they fired um, a U-235 bullet into a target and created a critical mass, but this method was too slow for other fissile materials like plutonium. Um, so they also came up with uh, an implosion type fission device which is much uh, more complex and difficult. Um, so that's why they had the Trinity test um, before they effectively used it in Nagasaki. But nevertheless, they called these gadgets, and um, they really were prototypes, and they turned them into deliverable bombs. But they were really deployed in an experimental fashion. It was really uh, seat of your pants stuff. They didn't really quite uh, know what was going to happen. Um, as it turned out, um, the little boy released uh, 15 kiloton yield, and um, and uh, um, and uh, Fat Man, uh, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, released about 20 kilotons. Um, I'm not really going to say anything about thermonuclear weapons, other than that's what we we mainly have now, um, and um, most of the information is still classified, so anything you find might not be terribly reliable. But basically, you use a fission bomb to trigger uh, fusion in a separate capsule. Um, they are fantastically more powerful. And um, um, there was some debate at the beginning whether we should actually go ahead. Oppenheimer was against going ahead and building these things completely from the start. Um, bomb yields are really enormous. The largest conventional weapon has a yield of about 11 tons of TNT. The Hiroshima bomb, as I mentioned, about 15 kilotons, the typical warhead, 300 kilotons. And the largest detonation um, was uh, the Tsar bomb, which was done by the Soviets and had a yield of about 50 megatons. So, um, you know, to give some comparison to, to that, um, I think the total ordnance that was dropped by the Allies during World War II was about three megatons. So we're talking about massive, massive amounts of explosive power. Um, what do they do? Well, 50% comes off of blast energy, 35% as thermal energy, and 15% as nuclear radiation. There's both prompt gamma, um, release of gamma rays, but also um, you're going to have um, latent radiation in the fissile, um, decay, decay, decay chain of fissile um, the products of, uh, uh, what do you call this? So, um, the, um, the shock wave um, that's produced by the fireball, um, explained in this little cartoon, um, if we have an explosion over ground, the spherical shock wave generates steep wave fronts. Um, some of them reflect off the ground, creating tremendous turbulence and winds. Um, here we've measured the overpressure um, and distance from the explosion. And we're talking about um, a gradient in pressure that's going to generate so you both have the crushing effect of the blast wave, but you also have these very strong winds that are generated by the gradient pre gradients, pressure gradients that follow from the blast wave. Um, um, at 5 PSI, um, you know, we're talking about uh, an overpressure that will destroy residential buildings and generate 160 mile an hour winds. At 10 PSI, Commercial buildings are destroyed, and you've got something like 300 mile an hour winds, which are which are not natural. They don't exist on planet Earth. Um, the Americans did a test to calibrate all this back in 1953 with a 16 kiloton weapon at the Nevada test site. And um, here's some images from a total of 2.3 seconds of exposure um, of a small residential house. They built one kilometer from the bomb. And uh, you can see the uh, electromagnetic radiation hits first, starts to incinerate the front of the building. But before it can really do its job, the blast wave hits and basically pulverizes the structure into nothing. 
Um, if we look at modern weapons, they're tremendously more powerful. A typical warhead is variable in its yield, but um, uh, a typical amount might be 350 kilotons. This was exploded at above over 2,000 meters, and we see the overpressure of 10 psi extends out to about 3.2 kilometers from ground zero. So we're talking about nearly 100% fatalities within that, within that uh, radio. Um, then we've got widespread destruction up to 4.8 kilometers with a 5 psi, 50% fatalities, and um, third degree burns will expend, extend out to about 7.2 kilometers. Um, basically, this is not a weapon. This is not a military weapon. It's not a weapon of war. It's a weapon of genocide because it doesn't discriminate in these orders of magnitude. Um, New York was the subject of our little video, so, um, so it's good to see how this uh, looks over Manhattan, close to ground zero from 2000, um, September 11th, 2001. Um, well, the 5 PSI region is extending out into New Jersey. It's uh, covering half of Manhattan up to Central Park and uh, into Queens. Uh, it's, uh, it's a tremendous area in the most highly densely populated and geographically smallest area in America. Now, 250, um, 58 million people live within 250 miles of Manhattan. And so one of the things that was less uh, well understood for a long time by the war planners and what they, is they estimated casualties due to the blast and radiation effects, but they didn't include fire. And the firestorms that are generated by these uh, these uh, nuclear weapons are likely to be far worse than they had any idea at the time. And modern, modern models are showing the radii of uh, effect from the firestorm might be up to three times larger. So it's a tremendous area that's affected by just one of these weapons. Now, of course, we have a, um, uh, the real uh, tragedy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where these weapons were actually used. And um, 100,000 fatalities from the Hiroshima bomb, which was only 15 kilotons. Um, basically, the firestorm extended out four square miles. And um, pretty much anything that wasn't pulverized by the blast wave um, was incinerated by the firestorm. So here you can see this awfully awful picture of uh, Hiroshima. Um, which, incidentally, if, if, if you visit Hiroshima now, it's a city that's uh, like risen like a phoenix from the ashes, which is a real testament to uh, human resilience. But it, it's just this unimaginable tragedy. Um, it's also staggering to think this is a plutonium, uh, equivalent size of a plutonium pit that would uh, generate that intensity, that yield. And it fits in the palm of your hand. So that the bomb on Hiroshima was, of course, a uranium weapon. So it's a little larger. But, um, and now, the last thing I, I should say about the effect of nuclear weapons is climate disruption. So, um, since the 1980s, scientists have been warning about nuclear winter. You might remember Carl Sagan going on about these things a long time ago and warning us about the climate effects of uh, nuclear war. Um, but what's changed in recent years is that climate models have become much more advanced, and we understand much better the effects of these things. So, as I've mentioned, burning is a terrible, terrible after effect of the, uh, the, blast, the, the use of a nuclear weapon. And um, that produces an awful lot of soot. Now that rises into the stratosphere, blocks out solar radiation, and we have resultant temperature and sunlight decreases. So um, there's been regional studies of this. Uh, for instance, a very limited uh, war between India and Pakistan, where each uh, use uh, 50, 15 kiloton Hiroshima-sized bombs. So that's only uh, one-tenth of a percent of the world arsenal. But this would generate six million tons of soot. Um, this, uh, these cli modern, modern climate models show that we'd be looking at a very significant and very unprecedented temperature drop. Um, this could last, this could affect um, planetary climate systems for up to 25 years and leave 2 billion people 
at risk of famine. Um, what's really interesting about this is that many more people are likely to be killed um, outside the war zone than within it. So this is one of the real new realizations and uh, much more research is needed on this issue because it's something that's not yet very well understood. Um, so, um, last but not least, before I hand over to Peter, uh, the climate models have also been used to look at the effect of a full-scale U.S.-Russia nuclear war, the sort of things that war planners still consider. And um, this is something that will cause global participation in temperature changes which are enormous, temperatures dropping by more than 7 degrees Celsius. Um, Nobody really understands this very well. There's a wonderful uh, top of the field group in uh, New Jersey which are working on this, but, um, but it's not a funded area of research. So don't think for a moment that uh, governments understand the implications of these weapons. Nobody understands them. Um, but with this severity of weapon, we're talking about uh, caloric, caloric intake per capita being less than resting metabolic rate. So we're talking about global starvation and possibly the end of civilization and humankind as we know it. So um, um, this is something that needs much more research and it's something that's very urgent we need to do something about. And so I'd very much like to hand over to my colleague, Peter, who will take it from here. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, David. Um, now I have to uh, uh, work out how to work the, uh, work the tech. It seems to be all right. Um, what David has shown us is very scary. Uh, it is extremely scary, and we should be worried about it. Uh, what I want to talk about is to try and burrow, burrow down a little bit into the various risks and see what it is that we can, if anything, do about mitigating those risks. Now, clearly, the risks from nuclear weapons depend, once the weapons have been invented, clearly depends on how they are tested, how they are deployed, and potentially, as David's been talking about, how they are used. This is just a plot of nuclear testing from 1945 through to 2018, uh, just to show you how it developed. This little bit down there is the US testing before they dropped the bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This little bit there, the, the red is the first Soviet test. And then you see there was a huge uh, sort of proliferation of tests which went right through the 60s and the 70s um, and the 80s. And then, for reasons we'll talk about, rapidly, uh, rapidly petered out. In all, there were something like 2,050 uh, nuclear tests conducted in uh, about 60 places uh, on, on Earth. So, that's testing. We will come back to it uh, a bit later on. Deployment. Uh, classically, nuclear weapons are deployed in one of this three so-called nuclear triad. Submarines, bombers, uh, ICBMs. Um, of course, there are mixtures. You can have missiles on bombers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But those are the three classic things. There are some disadvantages and some advantages and some risks in different risks uh, with this kind of deployment. Um, submarines obviously have the advantage of being difficult to spot and difficult to strike, and hence they are likely in a war situation to survive a first outbreak of hostilities, be those hostilities nuclear or conventional. However, they are prompt, as it says there in the sense that once an order has been given, and the weapon has been released, that's it, can't do anything about it, can't, can't recall it. ICBMs are clearly similarly prompt. Once you've released it, can't do anything about it, and they're less survivable um, because they are on land um, and don't move around. Uh, aircraft uh, are not prompt in that sense. They are recallable up to a certain point, because the aircraft has to reach a certain point before it releases its, its um, bomb or its, um, or, or its missile. Uh, and they're also flexible in terms of 
what they can carry and uh, the type of delivery. So you can see that the risks of those kinds of deployments uh, are different for the three, three branches of the nuclear, the nuclear triad. Also in deployment, there's clearly dangers which are associated with various kind of policies which the countries which use, <laughs> hold nuclear weapons um, adopt. Um, clearly the policy of having weapons on very short notice to release, a so-called hair trigger, uh, clearly increases the risks of unintended or mistaken uh, release of these horrific weapons with clearly disastrous cons consequences. Having a policy of launch on warning, uh, namely that if you get a warning that uh, your, op your opponent has launched a missile your way, you don't wait to find out, you just launch one um, back at them, uh, risks all kinds of mistakes taking place, as we shall see in a couple of slides. The rationale for that is, to the war planners, I guess, is obvious, that the transit time of an ICBM from Russia to the US or back the other way is about 25 minutes. And therefore, you have something like five minutes of decision time, they say, by the president of whichever country we're talking, to decide whether to retaliate or not, which just says that a launch on warning policy is extremely, extremely dangerous. And lastly, in this quick survey, the absence of a no first use policy by countries holding nuclear weapons clearly opens the risk that a nuclear weapon will be used in a hitherto conventional uh, war, just as Putin is threatening to, or at least saber rattling and suggesting uh, that he might use uh, nuclear weapons in the Ukraine conflict. Not to have a no first use policy uh, was the policy of NATO right throughout the Cold War. It remains uh, the policy of, uh, of NATO. Uh, it would be nice to change that. And clearly, if all sides, if all holders of nuclear weapons had a no first use policy and trusted the others, then there wouldn't be much point in having those weapons in any case. And one might actually be able to move forward uh, to abolish them. So much, for, so much for hoping, I guess. Just a little um, illustrations of this. I won't go through them in, uh, in grim detail because it's all rather scary. These are some false alarms, five false alarms which happened uh, between 1960 and 1995. <laughs> so far, basically, we have been lucky. Lucky that mistakes have been discovered before a retaliatory uh, strike, so-called retaliatory strike, was launched. Or in some cases, we've been lucky because military have actually disobeyed their standing orders and not informed up the chain to the president uh, that they have, they believe, seen something coming their way. Similarly, there have been various mishaps uh, with warheads uh, luckily, none of them actually uh, proved disastrous, but it just, <laughs> it just worries you when you feel that people are transferring these things around and they're dropping them and they're losing them, and, uh, what, the, what the consequences might be. Again, we have been lucky. And I draw your attention to this uh, statement by former head of um, US Stratcom. We escaped the Cold War without a nuclear holocaust by some combination of skill, luck, and divine intervention. And I suspect the last in greatest proportion. So it doesn't, it doesn't suggest that these are well controlled, um, well understood, um, uh, and uh, well deployed uh, weapons. So, so much for that. Clearly they have, as you know, been uh, numerous attempts during the Cold War and since the Cold War to put some limits on what governments do with these weapons, whether it be testing, proliferation, uh, deployment 
uh, of nuclear weapons. And these discussions have led to a number of treaties, um, either multilateral treaties amongst large numbers of countries or amongst uh, a few nuclear weapon states. I will briefly just try and go through them and come back to one or two of them uh, later, uh, being worried a bit about the time. The first two, as you can see, are about test bans, uh, a partial test ban treaty from 1963, and all tests except those done underground as a reaction to the public uh, anxiety about the explosion of tests. Sorry, that's the wrong word. The multiplication of tests of, uh, which, had, um, which had taken place. Um, that was followed many years later, uh, 33 years later, by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which actually bans all explosions, whether for military or nuclear explosions, whether for military or civilian purposes. It was adopted uh, by a large number of countries, by the UN General Assembly, but to enter into force, it requires the ratification of 44 specified countries, and of these, eight uh, have not ratified, and therefore this has not uh, come into force. Of those who have not ratified, they include USA, uh, China, and, uh, if you like, the pariahs, Israel, India, Pakistan, and uh, North Korea. However, as you may have noticed, or you probably didn't notice on the graph about testing, all except uh, North Korea have actually accepted a moratorium on testing uh, since 1999. So it has, um, it has done some good. The next two are about essentially proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. The NPT, the 1968 Non-Proliferation Treaty, which we'll come back to, uh, is imperfect, but it's actually had to do a huge amount of um, a huge amount of work in trying to uh, prevent proliferation of, of, of nuclear weapons. It prohibits non-nuclear weapon states uh, from obtaining nuclear weapons and obliges the five nuclear weapon states who have signed the treaty, uh, namely US, USSR, UK, France, and China, to work towards uh, nuclear disarmament. The holes are that, if you like, the nuclear armed states who are not uh, party to this treaty, uh, namely uh, Israel, India, Pakistan, and DPRK, are not covered, uh, nor is, uh, uh, are, if you like, some others who might like to go that way. So it has much, much more recently, only five, six years ago, 2017, uh, there was a uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, I will come back to that a bit later on. Uh, but it was, it was a, again, a multilateral treaty done under UN um, auspices, but the five nuclear powers and the four the nuclear weapon states stood aside from it, did not take part in the negotiations, and therefore it has had um, so far little effect except a political effect. And then we have a series of uh, arms limitation treaties which are essentially between uh, the US and Russia all the way down. Um, I won't go through them in detail, uh, but the idea is that each of them try to impose limits on either the, the delivery systems uh, for nuclear weapons or the number of nuclear weapons which either side could, um, could have or deploy, usually uh, to deploy. Uh, for instance, SALT-1 uh, um, imposed limits on uh, the number of delivery systems which um, uh, either side could have. Uh, it didn't attack directly the number of weapons uh, or the strategic bombers. It was all about ICBMs. SALT-2 was supposed to add to that and plug those two big gaps, um, but for reasons we'll come to, uh, has never 
never gone into force. Uh, there was an intermediate nuclear forces treaty which banned a whole category of ICBMs, namely those of intermediate range between 500 kilometer range and 5,500 uh, kilometer range, uh, which was in force uh, for a certain time until it was denounced by both the Russians and the Americans first and then the Russians. And then a series of so-called start one and start two and then new start um, arms control uh, treaties, which were supposed to build on each other and again uh, reduced the number of weapons which each side could, could control. As I'll say later, the only one which we have existing at the moment uh, is New Start, which was negotiated in 2010 and restricts the uh, number of deplo deployed weapons uh, on each side to 1,550 and uh, limits the number of uh, uh, deliverable, uh, the, the, the number of um, delivery vessels, silos, uh, or uh, submarine launch tubes uh, to 800 each, I think, if I can remember. Um, so those were, the, those were the attempts, if you like, to uh, put some kind of constraints on what, was, on what was going on. This is the effect, which is quite a dramatic effect showing the number of um, uh, warheads as we move from 1945 to 2020. And you can see there's a dramatic reduction from about uh, 19, 1987 by the, through these bilateral, bilateral treaties. However, what does it get down to? Well, it gets down to something like 10,000 to 9,000 something in, in total. Uh, the US and Soviet ones, which are the ones we really have to worry about uh, very much, are each down to their limit of 1,550. Um, and that may, you can argue, actually reduce the risk of a nuclear accident, shifting these things around. It may increase a bit of transparency because each side can keep track of what the others' uh, um, warheads are, are doing or being moved around because uh, there are fewer of them. But ultimately, it doesn't actually reduce the risk to humanity that much, because the risk to humanity is not from the last additional weapon. The risk to humanity is actually from using any one of the 10,000 which are still there um, uh, in, almost any, in almost any circumstance. And this is just a... Um, a breakdown of nuclear warheads uh, as they are today by country, as I say, something under 10,000 uh, at the moment in stockpile. And just to reinforce uh, a point that David made um, about the, the explosive force of these things, there's a record, they reckon there is a total of several thousand megatons of TNT equivalent in the existing 9,000 um, and something uh, weapons, equivalent to roughly 200,000 Hiroshima bombs. Now we saw what one did. Why do we need 200,000 of those things, or, or indeed uh, any of them? And as David said, that several thousand uh, megatons of TNT compares with three megatons of TNT which is the total amount of explosive which was used throughout World War II. So this is stuff which would directly, directly kill billions of people if used. It's quite extraordinary, the, the magnitude. So, where are we now? And what, if anything, uh, can we do about it? Uh, this is just a picture of the, the doomsday clock, which um, uh, David mentioned which uh, in January this year was set to 90 seconds to midnight, signaling uh, that the atomic scientists actually judge how close we are to a nuclear holocaust, much closer, as David said, than uh, 
we were at, at any stage during the, during the Cold War. There are a number of contributions to this, uh, this situation as they judge it. Um, firstly, the sort of fought geopolitical situation in which we find ourselves. Increasing confrontation between the US and China and Russia. Continued chaos uh, in the Middle East with countries like Iran, uh, obviously thinking about uh, nuclear weapons. And if they were ever to go down that path, then others would follow them, such as Saudi Arabia. Uh, instability in East Asia with China becoming more aggressive. And the West itself being hit by a number of, a number of crises, global financial crises, COVID, Ukraine war, energy, food security, cost of living crisis, which actually have reduced both the power of the West overall and its self-confidence uh, in the world. And in addition to, to that, there are, there are other issues which are just making it more complex. Um, as we know, there has been a certain amount of proliferation to these uh, nine countries, the five nuclear powers and the four, uh, the four others. But in the, the complex world, the complex geopolitical world that we have, uh, it is much more difficult to restrain uh, proliferation any further. There's worries about non-state actors. What happens if an Al-Qaeda or uh, an ISIS were to get hold of some nuclear technology, even if it was only uh, technology which enabled them to produce a, um, a, a dirty uh, radiation bomb? There's a possibility of cyber attacks uh, in the present state of non-cyber control, if you like. Um, cyber attacks on weapon systems, cyber attacks on defensive systems, cyber attacks on control systems, all of which raises extremely the risks of mistakes uh, or malfunctions. And you may well have read this from one of the US, uh, William Perry, former US Secretary of Defense. The danger of some sort of a nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War. And most people are blissfully unaware of this danger. And that was in 2015. And I think we'd have to judge that the situation now is considerably worse than it was in 2015. Added to this is what I would call the near collapse of the arms control regime, which I talked about before. I talked about the, the weaknesses of the, the NPT treaty. Uh, weaknesses of SALT-1, which were supposed to be, gaps were supposed to be plugged by SALT-2, but SALT-2 was actually not ratified by the uh, US because of the Russian invasion of um, Afghanistan, and so it never entered into force. The IN INF Treaty uh, was there from 1987, but then the US withdrew in 2019, 23, three and a half years ago, um, because they were worried about the build-up of Russian and other, other forces, and so then the Russians withdrew. So that is now uh, a non-treaty. non, a non -treaty. Start one uh, continued in force until 2009. Start two was supposed to take over from that, uh, but was actually shelved prior to implementation in 2003. Why was it shelved? Well, it was shelved, um, it was shelved because the Americans withdrew from the ABM, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2003 under, uh, under George Bush. Uh, the Russians had made it contingent on the ABM Treaty staying in force. Uh, their ratification was contingent on that. So they didn't ratify, and it was shelved. So what we are left with is New START, which, as I say, uh, um, still exists, imposed a limit on the um, uh, 1,550 on weapons on each side. Um, 
and it was extended in 2021, uh, but only by five years until 2026, which is actually a very short time for us to actually negotiate something else. Just in February this year, on the first anniversary of the launch of the Ukraine invasion by the Russians, Putin announced that uh, Russia was suspending its, um, uh, its adherence to start. It wasn't withdrawing. It was just um, not going to cooperate in the various exchanges of information which had to take place. Although luckily, they did agree that they were going to continue to stick by uh, the limits on, uh, on weapons and weapon systems, which they'd agreed to under start. But that is the, that and the NPT are really the ones which we have to hang on to at the moment. St New Start is the only uh, strictly arms control um, instrument that we have at the moment. Oh, sorry about that. Did I do something wrong? Yep. Added to that, uh, which we've, we've touched on before, there is weapon modernization going on in uh, the US, the UK, uh, Russia and China, and there are new weapons and uh, being researched and uh, soon put into um, uh, into operation by Russia in particular, with the Americans and the Chinese struggling to uh, to keep up, so that the Russians don't have a a lead. And here is Putin's threat uh, to Ukraine, which I mentioned. Whoever tries to interfere with us should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead to such consequences as you have never experienced in your history. Now, we can debate whether and in what circumstances Putin would actually use nuclear arms, and clearly people are trying to uh, deter him, but it is there creating that uncertainty and fear, basically. So, finally, and I'm very conscious of the time, uh, Moritz, but we'll try and uh, breeze through this. The question is, what can we, as scientists and concerned citizens, do about this pretty dire situation uh, in which we find ourselves at the moment? Luckily, we have to look back on uh, a long history of scientists, physicists in particular, trying to warn of the risk of developing, let alone using, nuclear weapons, uh, some of which David has, has mentioned. Um, and I will just quickly mention again. But it started in 1945 with a frank, the Frank Report to the US government and a petition from uh, Szilard and a number of members of the Manhattan Project to the US government before uh, the explosion of the bombs over Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. Um, that didn't persuade people uh, that they had to, they had to stop. And so, uh, as mentioned, 1947, uh, Zillard and Einstein found the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, and we had this declaration from Einstein at the time, which I think is, is very poignant and, and important to us. We scientists recognize our inescapable responsibility to carry to our fellow citizens an understanding of the simple facts of atomic energy and its implications for society. In this lies our only security and our only hope. We believe that an informed citizenry will act for life and not for death. Again, I'm not sure how much effect that had on governments. Post-47, we had this expansion of um, nuclear testing and then nuclear arsenals. And so we come to the Russell-Einstein Manifesto uh, leading to the foundation of Pugwash, uh, which um, David, uh, David took you through before. Just a word from me on uh, Pugwash and multi-track diplomacy. Um, Pugwash, as noted, started as a conference of concerned scientists and others who were just keen to avoid the horrors of nuclear war. It's now an international movement seeking, in quotes, dialogue across divides. And 
one of the main important ways of trying to establish that dialogue across divides is via what is known as track 1.5 and track 2 um, diplomacy. Um, I guess you can tell that it was scientists who labeled it that. Um, they have to have a, you have to have a numerical, um, uh, numerical label. Conventional government to government uh, diplomacy is, is labeled as track one. Groupings and meetings of civil society experts, including, uh, very importantly, scientists, uh, typically from, from the West and from the Soviet bloc during the Cold War, uh, is labeled as uh, track two. And track 1.5, fairly obviously, is a mixture of the two when you have groups of civil society experts, including scientists and uh, government officials from the both sides meeting privately to try and find ways forward, consensus, to try and map out what an area of agreement might be. And in those cases, the government officials are almost always acting in a personal capacity. Does this work? Does it have any effect? Well, I think you can judge that uh, by the fact that the Nobel Peace um, Committee clearly thought it did uh, by awarding the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize to Pugwash, the Pugwash Movement and to uh, Sir Joseph Gottblatt as uh, its co-founder. Um, and they particularly quoted uh, that this kind of Pugwash's use of multi-track diplomacy had laid the groundwork for uh, the Partial Test Ban Treaty, for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, for the ABM Treaty, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and for the Biological and Chemical Weapons um, uh, Conventions as well. It brings us to what can we do? What can we do? It seems to me that as physicists, as scientists, as concerned citizens, both old, <laughs> like some of us, but also most importantly the young, because this is their future which we're talking about, have got to re-engage with these issues. That's a point of departure for the American Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which David was talking about, and it's the point of departure for what we're now trying to do in the UK, starting here in Oxford with this meeting, uh, calling ourselves physicists for nuclear risk uh, reduction. There's certainly plenty to do, and this slide, for instance, provides some examples. First of all, you need to actually support the structures which are uh, already in place. Uh, the NPT, despite all its weaknesses and holes, uh, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, despite the fact that the major, what the, the nuclear weapon states are not parties to it, it is a very strong political statement uh, by a large portion of the world that they do not want to have nuclear weapons and they want to see them abolished. And similarly, to support the continuance of the six nuclear weapons free zones which cover, as you can see, all the southern hemisphere and a bit more. Now, of course, they don't cover any of the nuclear weapon states and they don't cover any of the NATO states. On the other hand, it is, again, quite a powerful political signal that a large portion of the world does not want to have anything to do uh, with nuclear weapons. Briefly, I think we have to engage, uh, support and engage in multi-track diplomacy if that proves possible, to try and work towards successors to New START, which runs out in 2026. To work towards a replacement uh, agreement on missile defense, to work towards a replacement for the Intermediate uh, Nuclear Weapons um, Treaty. And I think we also, as probably as concerned citizens within civil society, need to support moves by governments, both in the West and in, in Russia, to what is known as sole purpose. That is, declarations by governments that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter and, if necessary, retaliate against nuclear attack on them. Uh, and it's interesting to note that this was a policy which was actually publicly approved and it seemed to be pushed 
by uh, Joe Biden when he was when he was vice president. Um, even better would be uh, if countries were all to come out and uh, have a, a, a policy of no first use. This is the declared policy of the Chinese, um, but not other nuclear powers. Uh, you can have some skepticism over uh, uh, that. But as I said, if you did have a no first use policy by everybody, that would be a very strong launching ground to try and work towards um, elimination of all weapons. Almost at the end, de-alerting uh, nuclear weapons. What is meant by that is putting into nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon systems and deployment systems uh, deliberate but reversible changes which would actually mean that the time to deploy such weapons would be longer than is currently the, the case and would mean that it would be impossible to maintain hair trigger policy or a retaliation on warning policy. It's just a very practical way of trying to get away uh, from those very dangerous, um, uh, dangerous policies. And finally, uh, we all need to, in whatever ways we can, contribute to the pressure which clearly comes from non-nuclear weapon states, but also from civil society within our own countries to get nuclear weapon states to start moving down the track of freeing the world from uh, nuclear weapons by defining what they have said is a stepping stone approach to uh, elimination, to define those stepping stones, and then to try and produce pressure to get them to take a few steps along those stepping stones toward uh, that elimination. Good. That is me done. Just a few incredibly simple, uh, basic um, conclusions. Uh, nuclear weapons are there. It can't be uninvented, clearly. But it is possible to reduce the risk posed by the existence of these weapons and to work for the elimination of the weapons. As David said, both of these elements, both reducing risk and elimination, have been neglected grievously since the end of the, the Cold War. However, it seems to us that in this tenser and more complicated geopolitical situation and the speed of technological change, we can't afford to neglect them anymore. The risks are too urgent. The risks are too great and, and the issues are too urgent. And we have to admit, moving down that track, uh, reducing risk, trying to eliminate nuclear weapons. It won't be easy. It won't be a short process. Uh, but it is vital, and it is vital that we start. We can't just wash our hands and say, it's too difficult, not even worth, not even worth starting. And as David said, physicists and scientists more generally have the capability, some would agree with Einstein, they have the moral duty uh, to be at the forefront of this process. And I would suggest that the forefront of the process of doing something is to re-engage with the issues and to understand them, uh, which is the purpose of what we've, been, uh, what we've been trying to put across to you today. And if, in the process of that, you decided that you wanted to join Pugwash, and if, even more specifically, if you decided that you wanted to join us and proselytize, if you like, educate other colleagues in the physics departments around this, um, around this country, we'd be delighted for you to join us. Come and join, we don't call it a kosher, but physicists for nuclear risk reduction. Uh, we have a set of slides, we have, a, uh, we have texts. I'm sure we would be delighted to give them to you if you wanted to sort of help us start a, you know, our own positive chain reaction, which is people going out from here to other universities to say, here is a message, let's get together. Thanks very much. That's it.